Uh, first of all, I must mention that uh, in terms of uh, the mindset and the vision uh, uh, to offer checks and balances and to be an alternative government, uh, that aspect is absent, very much absent in Oka. There's no sense of urgency. There's no appetite to effect regime change in 2026. A good number of our colleagues in there, their position is that we should not be in a hurry to form government. Even 2031 is okay. You know, if there is anything that I fundamentally disagreed with, out of all the other things I might have been unhappy about, was that lack of agency among our fellow members in OCA to say, we don't need to be in a hurry to effect regime change. Who in particular is of that view? You know, you know the way OCA, uh, 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 I don't know whether to say is or was, I'd rather say was, because I can only authoritatively talk about what was there when I was there and what it might be today. Mm. Um, <clears throat> there are basically two camps. Okay. There are basically two camps. Uh, those camps, on one hand, uh, you have the chairman, uh, Sakura Squatter, you have Jackson Slavo, you have Varikalava, you have Sharakateka, and you have Sawa Imboira. That is one camp. And then you have the other camp, uh, which was basically myself, President Nawakwe, President uh, Dan Pure, and uh, President Lungu. And uh, we, we shared a common perspective on our side uh, in terms of the agency, mm -hmm. the fact that we needed to effect regime change in 2026. Uh, the issue of being able to identify a candidate so that we can have momentum and rally behind that candidate as we match up to 2026, and a whole lot of other things. We shared a common uh, perspective, whereas our colleagues, on the other hand, shared a totally contrary uh, perspective. They felt that we shouldn't be in a hurry in terms of forming government in 2026. We should focus on consolidating UCA and uh, that 2031 should be our target. Uh, also, that we did not need to identify a presidential candidate now, and that uh, even if uh, we unveiled an OCA presidential candidate on the day of filing in on, of uh, nominations, that would still be a good strategy. And their argument was that if we unveiled a candidate early, that candidate might be targeted by the UPND. But I always, uh, you know, felt that those excuses did not carry water because every uh, I don't think there's any politician who is not who, who is actually afraid of being targeted by the government. By the mere fact that you become an opposition leader, it means that you should be ready to be targeted by the government. And uh, that strategy just didn't make sense to me, uh, uh, Peter. But so the other camp were for that strategy. What what was your the other the other camp that you've identified and the camp you belong to? What was their opinion based off? picking a, a presidential candidate. That the sooner the candidate. better. The sooner the better we pick a candidate. And I must mention that uh, um, uh, that was one of the key points of debate uh, in the entire alliance. Um, that was a very uh, a big issue in the entire alliance. Because uh, we felt that, you know, once we identify our candidate, that candidate needed to be marketed. And uh, I was best Hi lovely viewers, it's me again, your one and only Mtati Mpundu. Welcome to my YouTube channel. If this is your first time on my channel, kindly subscribe to my YouTube channel by hitting the red subscribe button down below and turn the bell icon to join the notification squad. Don't forget to like, share and leave a comment. Tell me what you think about this video in the comment section below. I'll be super glad to hear from you, lovely viewers. At this point in time, allow me to uh, welcome my guests to the show this morning. Mr. Tembo, good morning and uh, welcome to the hot seat. Uh, good morning, Peter. How have you been? I've been okay. How have you been? Very well. Uh, and of course, a very good morning to all the listeners and viewers out there. All right. It's good to have you on uh, this morning, Mr. Tembo, because... Uh, there are a lot of things that have happened the past uh, two days, I think, regarding the United Quacha Alliance, which uh, I don't know if you, because from your statement, you said alleged expulsion. So I want to find out if you if you still maintain that you're a member of, of the United Quacha Alliance or not, but you were expelled from the United Quacha Alliance on Tuesday this week. How do you think this will impact them? your party's future for starters, uh, as far as collaborations are concerned, uh, with other opposition leaders? Well, I'll start by answering your first uh, question, Peter. There are two questions there. Uh, the issue of expulsion from Uka. Um If you read our statement, we made it very categorical that 
in as much as uh, that exposure was illegal and then procedural, um, we are not going to contest it. Mm. Yes. Um, the reason we're saying that exposure was illegal and then procedural is because of the manner it was conducted. Uh, as we clearly explained in our statement yesterday, the meeting that was convened in which our expulsion was resolved was not, had no notice, and we were not made aware of it. It was a meeting that was convened after the main meeting had already been concluded. You understand? And our version of events was clearly corroborated by the Secretary General of OCA, who, by the way, also resigned because of that kangaroo way of doing things. But I must be very quick to mention, Peter, that, um, you know, ever since we joined the United Party Alliance, the way things have always been done has, you know, to a large extent been in a kangaroo kind of way. For instance, uh, for some of us who come from a corporate world, we like to have an orderly way of doing things. And for instance, when you have a meeting, it is our expectation that the minutes of that meeting is clearly documented, the resolutions are clearly documented. If you are going to have rules, it is our expectation that those rules will be documented and will be in a form of a charter which everybody signs, so that if you have any conflict, you quickly refer to the rules and say, rule 5.2 says ABCD. You understand that? Eh? It creates good order in that way. But um, from the way to go, our colleagues in the United Party Alliance resisted to document anything. So they made the rules as they went by. And... Uh, 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 even resolutions. You spend the whole day debating a particular issue, you resolve. A week later, someone will say, no, we didn't resolve. And there are no minutes to refer to. So you start debating and arguing another day, the whole day you are arguing and debating. So there was that uh, strange way of doing business in Uka. Whether it was by design or by default, I can't really put a finger to it. But there was that strange way of doing things which I've never really experienced anywhere else. But that said, Peter, um, we have no desire of challenging our expulsion from the United Party Alliance. When we went to join the alliance, we went there in good faith because we believed that collaboration is the best way that we can redeem the Zambian people in terms of being able to offer a consolidated opposition in 2026 so that whatever comes in 2026, we can be able to excuse Mr. Haka and HDMA from office together with his UPND party because they have failed to run the affairs of, that nation, of this nation. But we are not saying that we are not capable by ourselves. Mm. We are capable. Uh, what we wanted to ensure is just to see to it that it is a definite done deal in 2026. And a definite done deal can only come about if we as opposition are able to unite. But I must be able to, uh, I must be quick to mention, Peter, as well, that um, from our standpoint, the decision by our colleagues to expel us uh, does not completely close the door to possible future collaboration. Uh, that is why I've got nothing bad to say about my colleagues in the alliance, individually or collectively, because the need to remove the, the, the UPND government from office and President Haga in the HMO from the presidency is a greater need than any kind of squabbling, any kind of conflicts we might have as opposition. That is why for me, the door remains open that in future, uh, whether at a different platform, we will still be able to collaborate with our colleagues in the opposition, including those that we left behind in the United Party Alliance. Mr. Tembo, I, I want to chip in there because um, you said you, for you the door is still open for you to collaborate with uh, you know other political parties. This is not the first time you're joining an alliance and leaving at the end of the day. You were part of the UPND alliance before it was called the UPND alliance. Uh, getting into the elections, you left that one. Then United Quash Alliance, and now there's this issue to do with uh, the exposure, you've been expelled. Can you provide some insight into the reasons advanced by the United Quash Alliance chairman for the exposure of of the opposition leaders, you inclusive, and do you believe that these reasons are justified? Well, the main reason that was advanced by uh, Chairman Sapivas for the State Council is that uh, we belonged to other alliances. Uh, for instance, myself and uh, Dr. Dan Bure were accused of belonging to the Tonsi Alliance, 
and uh, President Peter Singamba was accused of belonging to the People's Party Alliance. You understand? Now, when you look at those reasons, uh, just like we stated in our statement, they are not valid because even as we speak, you know, President Sakura Sikota is the chairman of the United Party Alliance, which is an alliance on this one, and he is, uh, to the best of my knowledge, still the chairman of the Zambia We Want Alliance. So he belongs to two alliances. And even in the meeting that we had on Friday, we put forward that uh, uh, argument to say, look, uh, we need to make a decision as an alliance if it, members are not allowed to belong to multiple alliances, then that rule needs to apply across the board. You cannot have a rule which applies to A, B, C, but not D. You understand? Mm -hmm. That's contradictory. But uh, like I stated earlier, Peter, you know, the manner uh, UCA has been conducting its business has always been contradictory. Uh, for instance, uh, when you look at the rules for someone to belong to the uh, so-called Council of Presidents, uh, someone must have stood as a presidential candidate in any election. You understand? Yeah, yeah, in the past. Now, uh, when the time came to admit President Peter Sinkamba to the Council of Presidents, the other individuals, about five of them, objected to that, to his admission to the Council of Presidents, despite the fact that President Peter Sinkamba had met that requirement because he has been a presidential candidate before. And yet, when you look at the composition of the Council of Presidents, you realize that there are individuals in there who don't meet that criteria. They've never stood as a presidential candidate in Zambia in their lives ever. You understand? Individuals like President uh, Jackson Sirawe, mm -hmm. President uh, Savoy Mboira, they've never stood as a presidential candidate. And yet, we have a role. You know, so on one hand, you are rejecting one person who qualifies while admitting individuals who don't qualify. Uh, and then even on the law of belonging to multiple alliances, I must state that for me, I'm not a member of the Tonsi Alliance. If I'm approached, then I'll consider it. But I'm not a member of the Tonsi Alliance. I've never, in fact, the first time I heard about the Tonsi Alliance is when I was accused of belonging to the Tonsi Alliance. I stated to say, for me, uh, our doors remain open. If the Tonsi Alliance approaches us and we look at what they stand for and it is something that we can uh, affiliate with, then we are going to consider joining them. But I've never been a member of the Tonsi Alliance and we are yet to be approached by the Tonsi Alliance. There's another reason that was put forward for, for your exposure. Yeah. Uh, I want to quote Mr. Scott. He said, you, you were singled out um, because you are being disrespectful and undermining fellow council members. You know, when you talk about this, when you when you talk about the issue of disrespect, uh, mm. uh, Peter, uh, the people in that council who are disrespectful are uh, Savoy, Imboira, and Jackson. Sir. Why do you say so? Because it's well documented. You know, these are individuals who have been disrespectful. The only time I had an altercation uh, in, in in one of the meetings at UCA is when uh, President uh, is with President Harikara, mm. and uh, it had to do with the language that he was using. Uh, when uh, debating a point, uh, a submission that President Lungu had made. So I said, no, you know, you can't be using such kind of language. You are referring to the former head of state. So use sober language. And on that basis, that's the only occasion we ever had uh, in terms of myself in the OCA Council uh, of Presidents uh, meeting. I've never had any other altercation other than that one. And, uh, you know, the strange thing about that is... Uh, um, when uh, I raised the point of order, in fact, it was President Dan Pule who raised the point of order regarding the language that was being used. And uh, Chairman Sapir Scott had to rule on that point of order. He ruled in favor of uh, uh, the language that was being used, that the language is okay, it is acceptable. Yes, I've always believed, Peter, that uh, uh, you don't need to use strong language for you to put across your point. If you put that across your point in a sober manner, it is likely to have buy in, as a matter of fact. So, for me, I strongly objected to that, and I must admit that we had a near puncher because of that. Because it was totally unacceptable. You had a near puncher with who? Anyway, let me not delve into those uh, details any further because it's not progressive, but that's the bottom line. Uh, you must understand, Peter, that um, uh, when you have these uh, affiliations, whether it is an alliance or whatever the case, you go there, you are a president, maybe you are a president of GPZ, the way President Sirawa is, or president of Citizens First, the way Karawa is, uh, or president of PEP, the way I am. 
But when you have that meeting, when you have that affiliation, you must not lose sight of the fact that some of the people that you are sitting on that table with are elderly people. They are people who qualify to be your father, even your grandfather. You understand? So um, uh, you are looking at uh, people like President Jungo. He's an elderly person. President Dan Pure, he is an elderly person. And even the last meeting we had on, on Saturday, the language that President uh, Jackson Silva was using towards uh, Apostle Dan Pure was the insulting language. And uh, Apostle Dan Pure objected to that. He raised the point of order. And again, when Chairman Sagura Scott uh, ruled on that point of order, he ruled that the language was okay. So I've never really understood why there is that appetite by the UCA chairman to tolerate and somebody language being used on elderly people by uh, individuals who are younger. They might be party presidents, but they are much younger. You understand? And uh, why in his personal wisdom, he doesn't uh, seem to realize that uh, uh, alternative language, more sober language can be used and the point is still being driven across. And for the purposes of sanity in a meeting, it's very important that sober language is used. But every time uh, our colleagues use the strong language in the meetings and we objected to that, the chairman always ruled in favor of that uh, insulting language being acceptable. Early so on, it became very strange yeah, to me. Yeah. Early on, you, you singled out to people. You said Savoy and uh, Savoy Mbuela and uh, Jackson Silab were very, have been very disrespectful. Um, and you said there was a near puncher. Are we right to assume you almost had a near puncher with the GOP president, Mr. Silab? Mm -hmm. I've never had a direct confrontation with Silva. Uh, the only altercation I ever had in Oka was with Hari Kalawa. That's the only one. Did you have and, it on one, Mr. and it was just on one occasion. Did you have any apology with Mr. Kalawa? Yes, we did. How was that result? Ah, uh, tempers cooled down, and then we went on. Is there any sort of future for this alliance, even when you're not part of it, from your experience? <laughs> you know, uh, Peter, if you are going to bring together uh, individuals and say let's work together uh, as an alliance the true value of that alliance lies in the synergy that would be created by coming together that is the true value of any alliance you must understand and that synergy can only come about if you are pushing in the same direction okay if you are pushing in the same direction all of you uh, you create synergy and you'll be able to achieve what one person would not be able to achieve. But even if you come together as an alliance and uh, uh, you spend a lot of time uh, fighting among yourselves, uh, uh, it means there's no synergy being created because whereas others are pushing, others are pulling. You understand? It's the same thing as, you know, you have a car which has broken down and you are alone, you can't push it. You call 20 people to help you push a car. But out of those 20 people, 10 are pushing forward and another 10 are pushing backwards. It will be the same as you were alone because the car will still not move. You understand? So, to answer your question, first of all, I must mention that uh, in terms of uh, the mindset and the vision uh, uh, to offer checks and balances and to be an alternative government. Uh, that aspect is absent, very much absent in poker. There's no sense of urgency. There's no appetite to effect regime change in 2026. A good number of our colleagues in there, their position is that we should not be in a hurry to form government. Even 2031 is okay. You know, if there is uh, anything that I fundamentally disagreed with, out of all the other things I might have been unhappy about, was that lack of agency among our fellow members in OCA to say we don't need to be in a hurry to effect regime change. Who in particular is of that view? You know, you know the way OCA, uh, 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 I don't know whether to say is or was, I'd rather say was, because I, I can only authoritatively talk about what was there when I was there and what it might be today. Um, <clears throat> there are basically two camps. Okay. There are basically two camps. Uh, those camps, on one hand, uh, you have the chairman, uh, Sakura Squatter, you have Jackson Slavo, you have Varikalava, you have Sharakateka, and you have Sawai Imboira. That is one camp. And then you have the other camp, uh, which was basically myself, 
President Nawakwe, President uh, Dan Pore, and uh, President Rungu. And uh, we, we shared a common perspective on our side uh, in terms of the urgency, mm -hmm. the fact that we needed to effect regime change in 2026, uh, the issue of being able to identify a candidate so that we can have momentum and rally behind that candidate as we match up to 2026, and a whole lot of other things. We shared a common uh, perspective. Whereas our colleagues, on the other hand, shared a totally contrary uh, perspective. They felt that we shouldn't be in a hurry in terms of forming government in 2026. We should focus on consolidating UCA and uh, that 2031 should be our target. Uh, also, that we did not need to identify a presidential candidate now, and that uh, even if uh, we unveiled an OCA presidential candidate on the day of firing in on, of uh, nominations, that would still be a good strategy. And their argument was that if we unveil the candidate early, that candidate might be targeted by the UPND. But I always, uh, you know, felt that those excuses did not carry water because every uh, I, I don't think there's any politician who is not who, who is actually afraid of being targeted by the government. By the mere fact that you become an opposition leader, it means that you should be ready to be targeted by the government. And uh, that strategy just didn't make sense to me, uh, uh, Peter. But so the other camp were for that strategy. What what was your the other the other camp that you identified and the camp you belong to? What was their opinion based off? picking a, a presidential candidate. That the sooner the better. The sooner the better we pick a candidate. And I must mention that uh, um, uh, that was one of the key points of debate uh, in the entire alliance. Um, that was a very uh, uh, big issue in the entire alliance. Because uh, we felt that, you know, once we identify our candidate, that candidate needed to be marketed. And uh, I was basically telling my colleagues personally, I was very vocal about that issue. I was telling my colleagues to say, look, if you look at the people we are going to compete with in 2026, we are talking about competing with the UPND, and the UPND have their candidates. It is other in the Ichiren, that's their candidate. We are looking at competing with the Socialist Party, and the Socialist Party have their candidates. Fred Member is their candidate. And then there is us, the uh, uh, United Party Alliance. We don't have a candidate. Even if people want to support us, whether materially, emotionally, or financially, they need to have a torch bearer for them to be able to pour in resources. Without a torch bearer, people will always have inertia in terms of being able to contribute to Oka. Even us, in terms of mobilizing on the ground, provided there is that procrastination to say, who is going to be the torch bearer? Is it going to be President Rungu? Is it going to be uh, uh, Apostle Dan Pule? Is it going to be uh, President Jackson? Uh, for as long as there is that procrastination, we are not going to be able to gain traction on the ground. And time is moving. And we need to have a sense of urgency because we are in the opposition. We are hoping to grab power from the ruling party. So we cannot afford to be sleeping until the last moment. We need to be on our toes. We need to be in a hurry. Whatever we do, we need to do it first. That was my position. Oh, Mr. Tembo, based on that uh, position, you both had different opinions. Yes. But there are some concerns that uh, you know some members of the United Culture Alliance may be secretly working with the UPND. Do you know these people? You know, I can only suspect. Uh, I don't know for sure, but I can only suspect. And uh, based on you know, you know the way Oka is um, or Oka was uh, Peter. It operated in such a way that um, uh, the moment you appear to be making progress. Uh, then someone, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of pulls you down. They pull you uh, uh, back, you know. Uh, you would have an issue. For instance, the issue of funding was a key issue, and we needed to address that. Okay, we needed to address that. Um, and we came up with the initiatives that could help address the issue of funding. And we deliberated on that issue, we resolved, we made the resolution. And the time we were just about to start implementing, then people threw in spanners into that implementation. They raised objections which they didn't raise at the time we were deliberating and resolving the issue. 
So we had to go back to that resolution again, and we had to show off that idea. So every time we appear to be making some progress in terms of um, uh, uh, getting the momentum that is needed for you as an opposition to be able to defeat a ruling party, someone put us backwards. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I were to narrow down, there were specifically uh, three individuals who always, at a very critical time, who always worked to pull us backwards. And in my view, those individuals were pulling us backwards because of specific instructions that they received from the UPND to say, frustrate them in this way, so that they are not able to make progress. Who are these three individuals? These are uh, basically uh, President Sirawen, President Saboy Mboera, and President Harikarao. So you suspect these people are... That's my suspicion. I suspect they are on the UPND payroll because of the way they were acting in the OCA meeting. Did you, did you confront them about it? I did. I did. You know, Peter, for me, hmm. I've never hidden my, my views about issues. I, I table my issues on the table. Uh, I don't go behind someone and start gossiping and start saying, I think that, that, that. So I table that issue. I confronted them. I asked them, are you surrogates of the UPND? I confronted them. And they started raising uh, side issues. They know why I was asking such questions. Hey, this, hey, that. But I challenged them. Are you surrogates of the UPND? Because of your behavior, you are acting like surrogates of the UPND. Because every time we come up with an OCA initiative, something that can take this alliance forward, two days later, you come back, you throw in spanners, and we are forced to reverse a resolution that took two days for us to arrive at. So your actions are designed in a manner to frustrate the progression of this alliance. And in my view, you are acting like surrogates of the UPND. I told them off in their, in their face. What was your defense to that accusation of saying when you put that forward, the, the surrogates of the UPND? To be honest, they never directly answered that question. They just went round and round. No, uh, it's not fair for one president to be accusing another president on the council. Hey, this, hey, that. But me, I tell you a very straightforward question. Are you surrogates of the UPND based on your actions? They never answered me uh, 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 in terms of that question up to the time that they actually expelled me from the United Culture Alliance. And up to today, I feel strongly that these individuals are actually surrogates of the UPND, that they are on the UPND payroll, and that any progressive alliance uh, that would involve them, they would still be able to frustrate that alliance. It is not in their best interest to have regime change in 2026. They are in cahoots with the ruling UPN debate. Because of joining us, we have uh, the President Petros for Economic Progress uh, leader Sean Temple joining us on the hot seat this morning. We're live on 87.7 uh, uh, here in Osaka and surrounding areas. We're live on 93.3 uh, FM in Osaka surrounding areas. Also live in Eastern Province on 97.7. Uh, on Panel FM. Uh, be sure to follow these proceedings. If you're watching us live on Facebook, well, throw in your questions. If you have any questions for Mr. Tembo, feel free to write them up and we'll be able to put them forward to Mr. Tembo on the show for him to uh, respond to you. Now, I read your, step, your, your, your statement and you, you expressed willingness to, to return to uh, you know, the opposition alliance under certain conditions. Can you elaborate on uh, you know what those conditions are and how how do you see this impacting the broader opposition move? Because there were a lot of political parties that came together to form the United Quachia Alliance. A lot of Zambians were waiting for the United Quachia Alliance to get their house in order. Indeed, uh, uh, Peter. Uh, for us, we're always going to have appetites to work with other alliances or other political parties in the form of electoral parts. And the reason is simple, Peter. Because if you ask me, I've got a very high appetite for regime change. And I know for sure that individually, as Sean Tembo, I might have the potential to remove President Hakainde Ichirema from office in 2026. But such a path would not guarantee the removal of President Hakainde Ichirema. You understand? I, I, I know I have the potential, but I know I have limitations as well. And I know that if me as Sean Tembo, I came together with another individual and another individual and another individual, the probability of being able to kick out President Hakain Dehichirema from office will be almost 100%, 100%. You understand? So it is about the appetite to ensure a regime change in 2026. And if I was to mention, Peter, uh, for me, I do not necessarily need to, you know, benefit individually from any alliance or any electoral pact. 
provided I'm happy with the leader of that alliance, it is someone who would be progressive for this country. I'm happy with the way the alliance is structured. I would be very happy to support that alliance, even if I don't have any benefit whatsoever. Even if I'm not the uh, presidential candidate, even if I'm not the running mate, even if I'm not going to be in the cabinet of that alliance, even if my party is not going to have any parliamentary or local government seats, provided that alliance will be able to remove the UPND from office, provided that alliance will, be a, will form a better government than the current UPND government, I'll be ready and willing to support it. That is how selfless I am. I'll be ready and willing to support it. The United Quasha Alliance, in my view, did not have the momentum, the zeal, the appetite, the hunger. You know, when you are in opposition, you need to have hunger and appetite to remove the regime which is there. You can't treat the regime which is there as if they are your buddies. You are okay with it. You are not in a hurry to remove them. Then what are you doing in the opposition? In fact, at some point during one of the meetings, uh, of the United Quechua Alliance, I challenged my federal presidents to say, okay, if you tell me and you are arguing uh, that we should not be in a hurry to effect regime change in 2026, then what are we doing here? What are we doing on this table? Why don't we disband and then reconstitute after the 2026 general election? Because evidently the majority uh, seem to support the idea that we should not be in a hurry to effect regime change in 2026. So, why should we exist now? Let us disband and reconstitute after 2026 so that we can focus on 2031. That was my challenge to them. Mr. Temple, you're saying you're very selfless and you look at these issues to do with alliances, uh, make a decision on what's best for the country. In the, in the, when you looked at the, the United Project Alliance before you joined, um, who stood up for you as to, to think, okay, if I join this, this group, this particular individual can lead the nation in 2026, besides yourself, that is, uh, can lead this nation and be selfless and can lead this nation to where you feel we should be. Because I say this, you have some choice words, choice words for President Galungu when he was president. You have some choice words for President Havana Ishilema when he was president. And before he was president, you are on record saying you will be, you know, worse than the previous, than, than, than President Galungu. Mm. So when you saw that grouping of the United Quasha Alliance, who stood up for you, who inspired you to say, listen, if I join these people, these people are selfless people, and I want to be part of this alliance. I'll tell you something, Peter. Uh, when I joined the United Quasha Alliance, my preference for presidential candidate uh, was President Ed Um And the reasons are simple. You know, President Lungo ran the affairs of this country for seven years. Okay. And in running the affairs of this country, of course, he scored some successes and he failed on certain issues. You understand? That's a, uh, 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 a common fact. Okay. And now we jumped ship to President Haga Inde Ichirema. President Haga Inde Ichirema has failed on all the things that President Edgar Rungo failed on. But in addition to that, President Haga Inde Ichirema has proceeded to even fail on issues which President Edgar Rungu succeeded on. I'd like you to give examples to that because we're going to get that challenge, obviously. Okay. Talk about the issue of contraction of debt. Okay. Mm -hmm. During uh, President Edgar Rungu's uh, administration, the issue of debt contraction was a big issue. A very big issue. You, you remember? Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, when you look at the contraction of debt, uh, when uh, PF came into power, or oh, let me just start with President Rungu in 2015, uh, the first of uh, January, when he came into power, take for instance domestic debt, domestic debt that is uh, treasury bills and government bonds issued by Bank of Zambia on behalf of government. Our domestic debt was standing at about 20 billion baht when he came into office. Mm -hmm. By the time we was living on the 24th of August 2021, our domestic debt was about 89 billion baht, and these are figures which are already available on the Bank of Zambia website. And the data on the Bank of, uh, Bank of Zambia website is very credible. Uh, I, I, I've been happy with their data so far. Uh, so there was an increment of 69 billion over a period of seven years. Now, from the time that uh, President Haga in the HLM took over office, in the last three years, our domestic debt has grown from 89 billion kwacha on the 24th of August 2021 
to more than 245 billion kwacha as we speak today. That's an increase of uh, close to 200 billion kwacha over a period of uh, uh, three years. Now, already when you compare the level of debt contraction, the, the debt contracted by President Haga in HTMA is far higher, more than about three times higher than yeah, the debt contracted by President Edgar Rum. But when you look at the benefits, we saw the benefits in terms of infrastructure development under President Edgar Rum. Even the face of Lusaka, even when you look outside Peter, uh, you see the way the roads look nice, especially when you take an aero uh, photo. You see how Lusaka has changed the face. Now when my friends come and visit me from outside the country, I'm even proud to drive them around Lusaka compared to previously when the whole city was potholed, even highways were uh, narrow roads. Now the face of Lusaka looks better. We have the new airport. We have this, we have that. So there was something that President Ed Garungu uh, was able to point at in terms of how he spent the money that he bought. Whereas on the other hand, President Haga in the ECM has borrowed more than three times compared to President Ed Garungu. But there's nothing to point at. Maybe I'm bad, uh, 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 Peter. Uh, maybe there is some infrastructure to point at. But as far as I'm concerned, there is no infrastructure to point at. So, on any given day, let me just, okay, let me just talk. Okay. Okay. On any given day, Peter, President Andy Garungo's uh, presidency was far better than President Haka in the HLMA's presidency. If I was to rate President Andy Garungo's presidency versus President uh, 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 Haka in the HLMA's presidency, I would give President Rungo maybe a 70%, and uh, President Hichirema, I would give him maybe a, a 15%, and I would be stretching it. Otherwise, he deserves the 2 or 3%, but I would give it a 15%. That's, that's okay. Uh, the bottom line, Peter, is that even when you look at issues like cadalism, you agree with me that the issue of cadalism was a big issue. Yeah, it was a big issue, still a big issue. Yes. Um, before you move on to cadalism, um, on this issue due to infrastructure, because I have to ask you this, because I remember us having a conversation. You were on the hot seat with me after this bridge was commissioned, after I think two of the bridges were commissioned, mm -hmm. and you criticized these these developments. What has changed now? So, when you look at the nature of my criticism, when these uh, developments were being done, it was based on uh, what I've always seen as short term planning in the uh, development of infrastructure in this country. You know, when you look at the infrastructure that KK was able to put up, he used to think 50, 100 years from now. You understand? Mm -hmm. uh, whereas the infrastructure that has been done in the recent past, people think 5, 10 years. So our criticism was based on the fact that instead of making this, these bridges dual carriageway, this dual carriageway will soon fill up with it, traffic and will be forced to expand to maybe three carriageway and four carriageway. Why don't we make these developments big enough in advance, you understand? And that applies to a lot of the roads that were done uh, during the PF. My criticism was that, look, when you look at this critical road, it's a critical road, why don't you make it dual carriageway or three carriageway, as opposed to making it a single carriageway, and then two years along the line, you start breaking it, making it a dual carriageway. That was the basis of my criticism. And that criticism still stands today. I've always felt that in our infrastructure development, we need to think 50 or 100 years from now so that we do things and do them and forget about it as opposed to going back to it. So that was the basis of my criticism. But unfortunately, under the present Haga in the HMS government, there isn't even any infrastructure that I can criticize to say it is too short term. It is not long term enough because there's nothing to look at. So that is the main difference between the shortcomings of President Edgar Rungu and the shortcomings of President Haga in the HLM. President Rungu's shortcomings, in retrospect, they appear like paradise when you compare them with President uh, Haka in the HMS shortcomings today. Do so you think you need to give him time, as in, because the major infrastructure that you, you might compare to President Edgar Rungu that you took pride in is the roads, of which the and UPND, the and the uh, hospitals, and hospitals, and hospitals yes. of which the UPND government also might say, listen, uh, President Sean Temple, look at us. We've also kicked off the dual carriageway. Look at what, what our CDF is doing. We're building uh, class, classroom Peter. blocks. Peter. Uh, and, and these issues that you, you need to take for us when it comes to infrastructure as well. Peter, uh, me, I'm a very uh, objective and fair person. Mm. And uh, I would have been very willing to uh, be patient uh, in terms of uh, uh, economic development when it comes to President Haga in the region. I would have been very willing except for one part. 
uh, how can we be patient about delivery of infrastructure when the government is contracting debt at a very fast pace, even compared to the previous administration? If under President Haga and HMA, there was zero contraction of debt and zero infrastructure, then we would be patient with them. We would think, okay, maybe they are still planning and uh, maybe they are taking a bit of time to plan. It's okay. We'll live with that. But when you have a situation where you have 300% debt con uh, contraction and zero infrastructure, then we cannot be patient, Peter. We cannot be patient. We have to challenge President Aga in the HDMI to say, sir, unfortunately, you are a failure because you are drowning this country into debt, but we have nothing to see for it. I'm going to ask you this. Is it fair to say zero when you've seen the projects that are also uh, underway under his, uh, his regime? There are no projects that I can point at to justify the 200 billion quarter which they have contracted in three years. You know that when you put it in quarter, it might sound like okay, quarter quarter is not of much value. But even if you divided that 200 billion using the average rate of say 25, it gives you eight billion dollars, Peter. Eight billion dollars. And where you spend eight billion dollars, Peter? Back on the Oneka or America or Europe. Eight billion dollars buffing the pounding. But all this money is being stolen by the UPND, by President Haka in the and his surrogates. Because you can't steal those big amounts without the blessings of the president. I know you're going to challenge me to say, where is the evidence that the UPND are stealing this money which they are borrowing? I'll give you a simple illustration. When you look at um, the Financial Intelligence Center trends report for 2022 and 2023, you'll be able to see that um, externalization, foreign, foreign financial flows have increased from about 29 billion to almost 40 billion in 2023. That is money being externalized out of uh, the country illegally. Okay, according to the official uh, financial data center uh, trends report. Now, I'll ask you a question. Here in this country, the way the economy is, if we are told that from January to December, 40 billion quacha was stolen from this country and the money externalized to the country, Peter, who could have stolen that money? It is not me, because I don't have that kind of money. It is not you, you don't have that kind of money. It is not the PF, because they spent a lot of time at court fighting uh, uh, fictitious, fictitious uh, court charges at the major state's court. They are all blocked. We are all blocked. The only people who have money are the UPND, their ministers and their supporters. So if 40 billion quarter is stolen from Zambia, as reported by the Financial Intelligence Center, the only people who have access to that money is President Haga in the HLMA, his ministers and his officials. They are the ones who are stealing that money, which is reported in the Financial Intelligence Center report. Unless you have an alternative explanation, maybe we have 40 billion. Mr. Tembo. Let's go back to the comparisons you were making. Let's go to calories. You are about to make a point there. Yes. So, Peter, I was uh, contrasting uh, President Bongo's uh, presidency and the President uh, Hakan's presidency. And I was highlighting the key issues uh, that we were unhappy with under President Bongo. The first one was the debt, the second one is Qatarism. I wasn't happy with the Qatarism. You weren't happy. Most Zambians were not happy with the Qatarism. Okay. And now, uh, the starting point is that that Qatarism was being perpetuated by private individuals. Okay. Uh, in the name of Qatars, who were wearing regalia of the ruling party and harassing citizens. Where and good. I'm sure President Rungu has learned his lessons, and if he was to be ushered back into office, I'm sure he would be more firm in controlling his party members as far as capitalism is concerned. But now, contrast it with the, um, <clears throat> the, the capitalism under President Haka in the HDM. The capitalism under uh, uh, President Haka in the HDM is not being perpetuated by individuals, private individuals wearing party regalia, no. The Qatarism under President Haga in the HDMA is being perpetrated by Zambia police officers wearing official uniforms while acting on behalf of the UPND party and carrying guns. Okay, take for instance, 
myself, I was um, uh, attacked. I call it attacked uh, 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 because that was an attack by Zambia police officers from Force Headquarters. Then uh, Joseph Kapasa, Blanche Pango, the, the chap called Isaac Ismenda, of course being led by their boss, Alan Mukare. You understand? They came to my house with the grinders and hammers. Okay. They broke down my, my, my door. And those are aluminium doors. They broke down my door, entered the, the house, beat me up, bundled me in front of my children. And they left. My my family started searching for me because they didn't know who, where they had taken me. They didn't even know whether those were robbers or police officers because none of them wore a police uniform. Only that for me, I identified them from previous arrests. By the way, I've been arrested about nine times under President Haga election, nine times over a period of three years. They took me, they blindfolded me, they took me. I was taken to some unknown place, further assorted, and this is a matter which, by the way, I've reported to the International Criminal Court, and I've got a reference number, I've got a file, and every uh, two to three months, the ICC gets back to me to say, uh, the, uh, the matter is still active, they will come to Zambia at an appropriate time to come and investigate. It's just that they are overwhelmed at the moment with the issues in Ukraine and the issues in uh, uh, in, 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 in Gaza. They are overwhelmed with other reports. But my issue is an active matter which is at the International Criminal Court. I've got a file at the International Criminal Court. I was taken to the outskirts of Lusaka, further tortured and assaulted. I was stripped naked. And then the day later, I was taken to a police station called Bomoro Police Station in the outskirts of Lusaka and dumped there with very specific instructions to the officers who were there to say, do not allow him to use the phone, do not allow anyone to visit him. The whole reasoning behind all that, Peter, is that I should have been there for a prolonged period of time. You understand? Without anyone knowing. And in the meantime, my relatives were going from one police station to the other. They visited more than uh, 50 police stations and police posts across Lusaka, even as far as Kanakantapa in Chongwe. My mother went there looking for me over a period of two days. And lucky enough, I was discovered at Bomoro. And I must mention that I was discovered by President Harika. I would, uh, I'm very grateful to him uh, having discovered me there. I'm very grateful. Despite whatever differences we had in Uka, I'm very grateful. And every now and then I do mention to him that, Mr. President, I'm very grateful for you discovering me at Bomoro Police Station. I was discovered two days later. You so you have this cadarism which is being perpetrated by officers in police uniform. And, uh, and that cadarism is not isolated. I'll give you just another quick example. We wanted to hold a rally uh, this Saturday in Petauke, at Petauke the Secondary School grounds. And um, we went to deliver a notice to hold a rally. And uh, the inquiries referred us to the admin officer. The admin officer referred us to the officer in charge at Petauke police station. And uh, the officer refused to get our notice. You understand? In terms of uh, the public order act, you are required to notify the police. And they refused to accept a notification. Not to make a decision on each no, but just to accept. Why? Because it's coming from the opposition. Why? Because the police, the Zambia police, at the moment, they are 100% cadres of the UPND party. And it's a pity that us, the citizens of this country, are paying their salaries. So on any given day, Peter, to answer your question, I would rather have a cadre who is harassing me and I'm not paying their salary than to have a cadre who is harassing me, wearing a police uniform, and on top of harassing me, I'm also paying his salary. That is more painful. So to compare the cadreism which was there under President Rungo and the cadreism which is there under President Haka Inde Ichirema, using officers that are affiliated to him, his personal uh, relatives and friends, because I know uh, for a fact that a good number of officers are directly uh, direct related to the president. So they get a direct instruction from the president, go and arrest Sean Tembo, we go and arrest the president. The ones you directly know, I, I know I, to the president and that are being given instructions by the president to, to do all these things that you are. There saying. might be others, but the one I know is Alan Mukare. I know that he's a cousin to the president. 
and he's a commissioner at post headquarters. I know that for a fact. Okay, he's a cousin to the president. So that is the reason why Peter, uh, when you are accused of anything, whether they accuse you of hate speech or sedition or any of the city charges that they normally charge us the opposition with, it will not be ordinary officers from your station near you who will come and someone you and charge you. Because me, I live in Werele. So if I commit an offense, why can't officers at Werele uh, uh, summon me, I go to Werele, they charge me and they handle the matter. Every time it's a political matter, it is officers from force headquarters. When a branch Pango, when a Joseph Kapasa, when a Isaac Simenda, who will come and kidnap you? You understand? They'll come and kidnap you. You know why? You know why they only use officers from force headquarters? It is because they want to use officers who get direct instructions from President Haga in the HDM. Officers who are related to the president. Officers where they can discharge illegal instructions. They can kidnap a citizen. They can uh, keep you for 13 days without police bond or taking you to court the way they did with those Gen Z protesters. Jason Mwanza. Mary for holding a placard at the Freedom Statue Reminding the president, not insulting the president, not shouting at the president, reminding the president in a sober way to say, Mr. President, you said you reduce the cost of living, reduce the cost of living. You said you reduce fuel prices, reduce fuel prices. That's what in a placard. Jason Manza and his two colleagues were arrested, kept at post headquarters at uh, Central Police there for 13 days. You understand? That is dictatorship. But I have a message for President Haka in the HDM. You, sir, you cannot harass us. You cannot harass us using your relatives at force headquarters there who you send to come and kidnap us. We are not going to allow you to kidnap us. And the reason is simple. It is because we are bona fide citizens of this country. We are not second, uh, second class citizens of Zambia. We are bona fide citizens of this country with the same rights as yourself, Mr. President. So we are not going to allow you to harass us. We are going to oppose you. We are going to challenge you until we remove you from office in 2026. Mr. Tembo, before we open the phone lines, um, I'd like to get your, your opinion on this. Uh, we're currently you know, facing a, an energy crisis, uh, the high cost of living, uh, among other pressing issues for Zambians. What concrete steps would you propose to address these challenges? Let's start with the, with the energy crisis right now. Most neighborhoods, some are saying they're going five days without power, others are saying three days without power, others are getting power, you know, uh, once a week, only three hours of that. So, so there are two aspects in yeah. terms of addressing these challenges, uh, Peter. There is uh, the short term measures that can be taken and the medium term measures, uh, as well as the long term measures. I'll start with the long term, then come to the medium term, and then the short term. Okay. The long term measures, of course, we need to invest in alternative renewable energy. Okay, uh, we've got an abundance of solar. We need to invest in that. But again, you need to have a government with the foresight and vision to think 50 years, 100 years from now, and not just a year or two years. Okay, that is the long term solution. Medium term solution is to ensure that come 2026, we remove the current UPND government from power because they don't have a vision for this country. They put their personal self-interest above the national interest. So, medium uh, solution to this problem is to remove the UPND in 2026. Whether at that time, me as Sean Tembo, I will be imprisoned or I will be available, the people of Zambia or whoever is going to remain behind after everybody else has been imprisoned should make sure that the UPND are removed from office and that we usher into office a responsible, competent, and visionary government. Those are the medium-term solutions. The short-term solutions, uh, Peter, to the road shedding. You must understand that even in the midst of uh, 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 96 hour road shedding, because like me, where I live, we have not had power since Sunday. So when you calculate the number of hours, and we tend to have power every four to five days. So you're talking about 96 hours or so. I don't know about where you live. Maybe you have power every day. Uh, we have power every four days. There you go. So in the midst of this very, very harsh road shedding, which, by the way, is, will soon, in my view, culminate into a health disaster. Because if the rains come with these levels of road shedding, people are not able to have water. 
we are going to have a catastrophic cholera outbreak. And I want the Zambian people to put me on record that I want the UPND government that the trend we are going on right now of prolonged road shedding, we are creating for ourselves a very catastrophic health disaster. Okay, so in the midst of all this, Peter, the government is still exporting power to other countries. Okay, the government is still exporting power to other countries. Now, you, you, you might uh, tell me, Peter, to say, ah, no, but uh, the Minister of Energy said uh, they will reduce the exports by 100 megawatts. We don't need a reduction in the exports. We need a total ban in all exports so that, as a minimum, we can reduce the hours of road shedding. In my assessment, and based on external reports from uh, newspapers in uh, uh, Namibia, Botswana, and other countries where government is currently exporting power, for instance, there was a, a report in, in one of the papers in Namibia, which uh, uh, indicated that uh, about 48% of the power provided in the past uh, three months was provided by Zambia. And their uh, consumption is about, I would say, about 1,400 megawatts. So if they say about half of that was provided by Zambia, it means you are talking about uh, close to 700 megawatts being exported. You understand? So why should we keep exporting power? Here they can lie, the minister can lie, but where they are exporting, people are honest, so they report these things. You understand? So me, when I'm looking for information on these things, I would rather monitor uh, uh, external newspapers and news outlets than to hear what uh, uh, the local uh, Minister of Energy is going to say in a press briefing, because they always lie. They've got a high affinity to lie to the Zambian people, and uh, they get that high affinity to lie from the President himself, from their boss. He has a high affinity to lie and lie and lie to the Zambian people. Last time he was uh, addressing Parliament, he was saying he's sympathizing with the people, that he doesn't sleep because of road shedding, but he's not doing anything about it. You are still exporting power, but you are saying you sympathize with the people. What kind of sympathizing with the people is that? So, in terms of the short-term measures, Peter, before we can even think about importing power, the first step is to cut all exports. In my view, if government was to cut all exports of power, we would be able to reduce the current road shedding to about maybe 10 to 12 hours a day, which would be reasonably acceptable. So that is the first step. The second step is to ensure that we import power. Now the question is, where would we import power from? Our neighbors here in uh, Tanzania, about a month or two ago, uh, uh, made an announcement that uh, they had to shut down about uh, uh, four or five power stations because they had the excess power on their grid. And the government said, no, actually, we are going to construct an interconnector uh, to ensure that we bought some power from Tanzania. But uh, up to now, uh, that project has not taken off the ground. Because an interconnector, if you are serious, you are merely putting up pylons, 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 before long you connect to uh, Tanzania over a shorter distance because we have power in Nakonde mm -hmm. and Tanzania has power on there. Uh, 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 immediate town there. So that interconnector, you are looking at a distance of between 15 to 20 kilometers. It shouldn't take forever. Why isn't government prioritizing to construct that interconnector between Zambia and Tanzania so that we can be able to import the excess power that is there in Tanzania? It's a matter of common sense. So if I was president of this country now, those are some of the measures I would put in place. Okay. All right, uh, we'd like to get you involved in this conversation. We have Rapid President Mr. Sean Tembo joining us on the hot seat this morning. You're listening to the hot seat on the hot FM 87.7. It's time for you to call now and get involved. Call now and get involved. Well, President Tembo, I'll allow you to uh, wear your headphones so that you're able to hear uh, our callers as they call in. 0974 870 877 0950-955-877. Good morning, you are through to the hot seat. Who do we have on the line? Hello, good morning. Oh, sorry. Hello, good morning. Good morning, PZ. Good morning, my son. Good morning, sir. Good. My name is Stella Good morning, Mr. Tukuta. Please go ahead with your question or contribution. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know what you're saying. 
As a leader that was vying for a certain office like presidents and stuff like that, when I would follow your Facebook page, your language for a leader like you would say, you know, you refer to a human being, to a man, you know, things like that. Uh, so even when you are speaking things that would have sense, at times as, as citizens that are looking, so okay, this guy may make sense, but when he speaks on his Facebook page, it differs from the uh, and so you can say that ah, is it just the bitterness or is it just the white? And also for me, when you see a person that is part of an alliance with uh, there was a European alliance, I remember uh, before you can be from government, that alliance left. Now the Uka alliance you left, and you are no longer in the Uka alliance. So. Your, what is your, your, in terms of your credibility, consistency, and what you believe in and stand for, you are kind of lost, like, you know, a headless chicken. Yeah. Uh, you, may, you have made some valid points, of course. I'm not arguing that, but you may have valid points, but I look at you in those angles. So, okay, this guy has no direction because today he will say this about Lungu and and tomorrow we say this about it is tomorrow another person will come and you also say this and stuff like that so it was your consistency and also if you look at um, I'm going to talk about the issue of uh, uh, you know the, uh, the economy okay one of the things also we are not looking at is I'm not using this as an excuse but also we should look at the Colopo situation right mm -hmm. i'm sure you are aware that mm -hmm. there are countries in europe uh, that are in the recession and all those things and uh, for me i would love to hear you also look at all those angles and uh, i agree with your short-term measure the solar issues and the next years but also you should also look at the fact that we had presidents before president that i did for example, shall I ask you to conclude? You've given yeah, me enough time. Yeah, yeah. Let me just conclude. The, those presidents, why did they start those projects? And also for the future leaders, I feel that when you come into power, don't stop what another person started because you feel that you will take credit. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tebo, I'll allow you to respond to uh, those comments. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'll start with this first uh, 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 comment mm -hmm. regarding the uh, Facebook uh, social media post. Yes. Yeah. I must mention that, um, you know, when you go on uh, Facebook and you search for the name Sean Tembo, do you know how many pages you're going to find? Not less than 100 pages. Anderson. And uh, the majority of those pages are actually created by our political opponents. And uh, I don't have any control about the issues that they actually post on those pages. And um, we've filed multiple complaints to Zika and this and that to say impersonation, but of course they never take any action. So when you see, especially if it is a screenshot, if you see a screenshot of a post which sounds uh, very rudimentary, uh, of, advise you to actually take a lot of uh, uh, caution. And if it is not a screenshot, if you are actually on Facebook itself, if you see a post and it appears again very rudimentary, I would advise you to scroll down that particular page. And if you don't see any post where I was personally right, because I go right quite often, and uh, a, a right video, you can't post it somewhere else. It means that is an authentic page or shown them. So those are the precautions I would advise anybody uh, who sees any controversial post. If it is a screenshot, take it with a lot of uh, uh, salt, a pinch of salt. 
if it is on Facebook itself, scroll down. If there is no live video, then forget about that page. It's a fake page. Uh, coming to his other submission to say, in terms of the economy, uh, uh, a lot of economies in Europe are in obsession. I think uh, 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 my friend Sherat should stick to uh, taking pictures and trying to analyze the economy because there is no connection between an economy in Europe which is in a recession and the Zambian economy uh, where President Haka Indechirema has borrowed 200 billion in three years and there's nothing to point at. So my advice to my very good colleague here, Gerard Bukuta, is that uh, uh, he should stick to photography and not dwell in issues uh, uh, that he has no idea in. I understand that uh, ever since he came from Brazil, uh, government has not paid his gratuity. And uh, I hope his uh, efforts to call into programs like this one and make disparaging remarks is not in an effort to try and get his gratuity from government. Thank you. He also highlighted you leaving alliances. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that makes you... Actually, to the contrary, it makes me a very principled person. You know, it makes me a very principled person. Um, because as a man, you must have boundaries. You must be able to say, uh, if you people cross this boundary, then I'm out. And for sure, if you, they cross the boundary, then you need to have the confidence and backbone to walk away. You need to have boundaries as a man. That is what defines a principal man. So, to the contrary, the fact that we are able to stand up what we believe is wrong, uh, uh, in my view, uh, lenders credence to the fact that we are a very principled uh, organization and uh, we are not shy to say what we see as being wrong. Under the patriotic front, we pointed out what we felt was wrong. And we did that with confidence, without any... Uh, uh, you know, without uh, uh, diluting our words. We said it in no uncertain terms. Uh, similarly, under the UPND, we are pointing out what we see as being wrong, and we are equally doing it in no uncertain terms. Let's get you more calls. 0974 Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Good morning to you. What's your name? Uh, Larry. Oh, in fact. All right, Larry. Well, President Sean Tembo is to you. What's your question or contribution? Yeah, my question and contribution is that uh, Mr. Sean Tembo, let us try to be honest, even as we speak and describe the government. Because when look at the number of things that Mr. this government has done and that it can do, they are massive. They are massive things that we can point at. Massive, which you are very much aware. You are saying Mr. Kind has borrowed, but there is nothing to show off. And yet you are seeing the recruitment, what is happening? The construction <laughs> of the roads. <laughs> Uh -huh. Mr. Tembo, let's try to be realistic in order to get to the right. Let's not confuse the Zambian people. We are all well aware. Let us make relevance even to get in the political space. Rather than deciding the government, condemning the government all the time. Mr. Sata provided relevance even as well in politics. So let us, I think, take that path. I think so much. All right, thank you very much. Um, your response to Larry. Well, <laughs> Yeah, some of these uh, uh, questions, uh, I, I find it boring to, to answer to them because they are self-explanatory. Uh, someone can't really argue that uh, the borrowing of 200 billion parts uh, over three years is justified by recruitment of teachers. Uh, you must understand that in a budget, there are two aspects to a budget. You've got the operational uh, part of the budget and you've got the developmental part of the budget. You understand? And uh, uh, we have other sources of income like taxation and electricity. And those sources of income are supposed to adequately address our operational needs in the budget. You uh, so when you talk about teacher recruitment or payment of salaries of teachers, that is the operational budget. When a government borrows, it is borrowing because it is funding what it is calling the developmental budget in the national budget, which is infrastructure, capital expenditure. So when someone borrows 200 billion kwacha, which is developmental finance, and there is no capital uh, projects to be seen, and the excuse is that it was used for recruitment of teachers, then that excuse does not hold water. Uh, and I must mention, uh, Peter, that when you look at the statistics of the number of civil servants, you realize that, um, and, and you divide it per annum, uh, you will realize that on average, between 2010 
and 20, or rather 2011 and 2021, the Patriotic Fund government actually hired in excess, that is both under SACA and under ICL, they hired in excess of uh, 400,000 civil servants. So per annum, we are looking at about 40,000 civil servants. Uh, uh, so, so when the President Hakai Ndeichirema hires, how many did he hire health workers? I don't know, 26,000. He hires this, he hires that. There is nothing out of the ordinary in that. It is just within the annual uh, targets of government in terms of hiring of civil servants that has been there uh, during the PF government, even during the MMD government. That is the annual target of government hiring civil servants. The only difference now is that uh, there is a lot of publicity that uh, the UPND government attaches to the hiring of civil servants so that they can be seen to be working. And the reason why the PF government and the MMD government never used to announce the hiring of civil servants, even though the numbers are comparable per annum, is because the PF government and the, U and the MMD government had the other tangible projects to point at, for them to be seen to be working. They had infrastructure to point at. So when they looked at the hiring of civil servants, they saw that as a petty activity which wasn't worth over-publicizing. So the fact that the UPND are over-publicizing a routine activity such as the hiring of civil servants actually is evidence of the dismal failure and dismal performance of the UPND government. Give us a call at 0974 870 877 Good morning. Uh, good morning, Casey. Morning to you. What's your name? Uh, Lazarus of the line. All right, Lazarus, we have uh, President Sean in studio. Uh, uh, good morning, President Sean Good morning, sir. Uh, how are you? Very well. How are you, sir? We are, we are trying. Well, we are suffering. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, let me, let me just say... Uh, President Short Tembo, you are saying things that they are, you are not sugarcoating anything. I think if uh, we are to call a state a state, this government has done in all aspects. If we look at what we were promised, especially us as you, because we voted in masses, because we, we were hearing what it, the president was telling us that you come and do. But if you check, Almost each and every sector is in disarray. If you check his performance against his promises, it doesn't even come near to anything that was uh, was put forward to us. So, I have one word for President H. Uh, we are not talking; we are sharing his cadre. And I promise him one thing: we we'll talk in the ballot. We seem to be, you know, we, we seem to be docile. We seem to be not talking or maybe taking any action. We are hearing the cadres in the in, in form of the police. But what he has to understand is 2026 is not far from now. As you will also come out, come out in large numbers and take him out. I think this is my submission. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Temple. Mm -hmm. It did. Uh, I just wanted to uh, agree specifically on the submission that uh, uh, this government has failed across all aspects. You know, Peter, um, uh, you, you cannot have a perfect government. Of course, uh, each government that will come, not only in Zambia, but in other countries as well, uh, they will have this you know, weakness, they will have that weakness. But uh, the bottom line is that a government should be able to deliver on the majority of uh, what they commit to do. You understand? So the performance, if the performance is, say, 80%, 90%, that is acceptable. We are not saying that the UPND should have been perfect. But when you look at this government, they have failed across the board. Across the board. Even basic, basic things like ensuring that athletes are paid ensuring that before the Zambia national football team uh, goes into camp, 
they are paid their outstanding arrears. They go into camp and they are complaining about their arrears, and you expect them to win games. You know, basic, basic things. Even if the people who went to the Olympics, ensuring that you pay them. We've got uh, some Congo who went to compete in that Diamond League, and he's complaining. He's writing long articles about it. He's not being paid. And you've got people when a are playing politics. No, some Congo is some Congo. Just pay the guy. If the guy has been paid, you think he would be writing those long articles? This is a person who is also serving um, in the Zambia National Service. He's a disciplined officer. So why would he go about lying? He's not a politician. Why would he lie about not being paid? And you, Kawana, now, you want to politicize the issue. You want to challenge the guy because you know he cannot uh, have as much access to the media as you do have yourself as peers. Don't, let's not work like that. Let us do things in a honorable manner. So UPND has failed across the board, whether it is agriculture, energy, uh, capitalism, uh, uh, just mention it. They have failed 100%. There's no question about that. And come 2026, the Zambian people will do the honorable thing. Just like we have removed governments which we have not been happy about, there is no exception to this government. So President Agayende HDMI should begin to pack his bags and his ministers should ensure that they do the correct things because whatever they are doing, whatever illegal things are being done now, those things will be investigated and the people responsible will be brought to book. Let's pick up more calls. It's 0974 Good morning. Good idea. What's your name? My name is the brain from Chidua, Manawasa, all those guys talking there before. Kaunda laid the foundation for us. Look up to now, we still have capital. Northern Grove is there, we have the customer at Chimba Falls. Mbala, that's part of it, we have the Salambo. What are we doing with those waters? So the problem we have, we don't feel that we are just very good at building. Even you, if you were the president today, I can tell you, I can assure you, you will just continue eating what Kaunda left for us. That's the problem we have. Look at the young ones. Today I was watching one, I don't know uh, if it's not one of the rural areas, where they were the investing power, having a phone and someone said, ah, you know, it's more than 700. The, 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 the solution of Zambia is not outside Zambia. The solution is within Zambia. We had those young boys, jet fish. What are we doing about that? Because it's such power they were generating. Why can't we call them? Can you give us your ideas? I will call the engineers, those who are going to school. Those guys are born with that fine. What they need is someone who is able to say this is big, this is big. But because of that challenge we have, we don't want to see the Zambian innovating something. We don't want to see the Zambian to say, oh, it was made by this and this. We don't want to say that Zambia. That amount of money. That's the same thing which we did with Sky Chiwa. We killed our own. So it's that that killer. So let's do away with that killer. And I wonder we politicians. We should be financial. You want to give us a say, forgive me, forgive me. Yeah, and you're, you're doing one and the same thing. Oh, yeah, let's change it. Let's have now. We were laughing at the people of Southern Province. You put a Tairoke, the Tairoke. But look, we have been hammered. The whole country now is suffering. Because of southern province. Never look at it for people. We don't have power because of southern province. John, Next I've given you enough time to get your point across. Thank please don't much. Thank you very much. All right, Mr. Zambo, please respond. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I'd like to agree to a large extent to the submissions by Mr. John, uh, but I have a, a one point of departure uh, in the sense that you are saying we cannot blame the UPND government for the ongoing load shedding. I'd like to disagree strongly on that issue because uh, the UPND, if they were a competent government, of course they might not have prevented load shedding from happening. Load shedding would still have happened because of the issue of the drought, but it would not have been as severe as it is today. That is my submission. And the reasons are simple. The reason why we have this very protracted road shedding, uh, Peter, if you allow me uh, to explain, is because of two issues. You must remember that at the time that the PF were leaving office in 2021, 
we were generating about 3,100 megawatts of electricity. And uh, we, our total consumption at peak hour has averaged about 2,300 megawatts. Okay, so we had an excess of about 800 megawatts, okay, which we were able to export. Even under the PF, we used to export power, but we were exporting excess production. Okay, now the question is why were we producing so much, uh, so much power under the PF? Um, it is because most of the power was being produced by what are referred to as independent power producers. You know, producers such as Mamba Koreares, uh, producers such as Indora Energy, uh, producers such as Reserva Power. So there was a mushrooming of independent power producers under the PF because of the policies, number one, that the PF put in place, and number two, because they were able to pay these people on time. You must remember that these are private companies. So when they produce and feed into the grid, they need to be paid in a reasonable period of time. And uh, what the UPND did when they came into office in 2021 is, number one, they started reviewing all these independent power producers. And for one reason or the other, almost 80% of independent power producers, they kind of uh, uh, canceled the contracts. Okay, they canceled the contracts. And their belief was that these independent power producers, in their uh, uh, minds, they were affiliated to the PM. So they wanted to ensure that all possible sources of income for the PF are cut off. So they cancelled the contracts with these independent power producers. And then our total production in terms of electricity as a nation dwindled from about uh, um, 3,100 to about uh, 2,400. So we had very little excess power. And then almost at the same time, we then uh, 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 began to have situations where the remaining independent power producers we are not being paid. So I'm sure you remember when the Mamba Korea is had to totally shut down production because they were not being paid. So that further reduced our uh, total output of electricity. And then by the time the drought came, Peter, the bottom line is that we were, uh, we were having very little uh, power to export. And then when they signed the new export agreements, the second mistake that the UPND made is that those export agreements, they made them unconditional, meaning that power had to be exported whether you have excess or you don't. You understand? The contracts that were signed under the PF were conditional on having excess, meaning that the moment you have a problem at Kariba or anywhere else, you will then cut exports because you need to satisfy local consumption. But the contracts signed by the UPND were unconditional. That is the reason why, even now, in the middle of 96 hour load shedding, we are still exporting electricity because those contracts were unconditioned. Now, which, which, which contracts were terminated from the independent power producers that you've, you've highlighted right several, now? Several, several. So I, I can give you a list. Uh, if, if I check on my phone, I can give you a list. Please yeah, show us that um, because we'll we need to know which, which ones were terminated. A lot of them. Were terminated. A lot of them. Uh, more than more than uh, five independent power producers were terminated, including the simple power and the dollar energy. They were terminated. Okay. And it was only after road shedding came about that the government then started reaching out to these independent power producers and telling them to uh, sign new contracts. Uh, if you search, even if you search online, uh, search for dollar energy or the power, you will find that the government was announcing to say uh, dollar energy will begin to produce 40 megawatts. Uh, that was uh, that announcement was made about four or five months ago in the middle of road shedding. Those people were on board a long time ago. They were forced to shut down because uh, Zesco could not buy their power and they couldn't sell it to anybody else. You understand? So that policy of targeting these independent power producers because they were perceiving them in a certain light is what killed the innovation. Right now, there's very little appetite in the private sector to engage in independent power production, except for those who feel affiliated to the UPND government. But in terms of an independent business person, because the risk is very high, you produce power, you are perceived to align to a certain party, and then they say, we can't buy your power. You understand? And then you are stuck with the power. What do you do with it? So that bad policy is what has actually made this road shedding to be as worse as it is. 
They are not saying that there would not have been road shedding. Road shedding would have been there, but it would have been reasonable road shedding. Maybe four hours, maybe six hours. But now we are having more than 90 hours of road shedding because of the poor policies of the UPN government. All right, that's all right for you today, lovely viewers. If you did enjoy the video, please don't forget to leave a comment in the comment section below. Tell me what you think about the video you just watched in the comment section below. I'll be super glad to hear from you, lovely viewers. Once again, I go by the name of Mutatim Pondum. I love you. Peace. I gotta go.